happened to be like? Is it going to be a V shape? Is it going to be a W shape? Is it going to be L, whatever? And it's, and it's almost the wrong question to ask because no matter the shape of the recovery, the composition of the headlight number, be it jobs, GDP, products, whatever, will be dramatically different, right? And that's really the important thing. So if you're thinking about the shape of the recovery, you're underestimating the impact because yeah. the big story is the composition. This is another episode of the Automate and Grow podcast. My guest today was nominated by Sean Flynn, and it's Ornobio Morelix. Did I say your name right, Ornobio? Ornobio, yeah, you got it. Oh my God, I did it. Okay, and Ornobio is, first of all, you're the Chief Innovation Officer at Startup Genome, and you're writing a book called The Great Reboot. So first of all, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. No problem. So, um, you know, you got two interesting projects and a lot of other stuff under your belt. But I guess, first of all, uh, what is Startup Genome? So we are a innovation advisory company and we help governments in over 35 countries with their innovation policy. And that's anywhere from uh, South Korea wanting to to develop strategies so that they, so they can have more of the new generation of tech companies, right? They had amazing technology and companies in the 70s in consumer electronics, but not as much of the new generation. So we help them with that to, you know, Denmark on their strategy of becoming a number one green technology hub. Oh, that's amazing. And now, so your new book, The Great Reboot, it was somewhat inspired by recent events, but maybe you can kind of start with like what it's about and what the thesis is. Yeah, so I'm the author of this book called The Great Reboot, which is about how to navigate the trends in technology and the economy in the post-pandemic world. And not just in, you know, in the next one to two years, but the next one to two decades. And the, I chose that name for the book because for the first time in 100 years, the economy is literally shutting down to start again. And not in just one or two countries, but everywhere. And much like a computer with a new operating system rebooting, the systems that blink back to life will be very different from the ones we left behind. And, you know, functioning some fundamentally different ways. There's tons of inspirations I've had for the book. One that sticks in my mind is uh, on February 2nd, I got this really weird email from a business contact in Beijing. And they were saying, it was like two lines, and they were saying something like, Please do not come to Beijing now due to the coronavirus situation. We had the trip scheduled for like 10 days later. And they said, reconsider your trip to South Korea. And, and that, that was our stop before China. And that got me thinking like, oh, like what's going on here? And that's when I really started investigating the topic, looking at it and studying it into more detail, building new strategies for it. And in March, I started a great reboot project proper, you know, with a website and things like that. That's amazing. So for, first of all, like, you, you know, part of your thesis is kind of consistent with one that I was sharing with you before we started recording, which is, um, you know, I'm looking at how t- companies can work together. But the first step is to make sure that you're on an innovation path. Make sure that you're aligned with, you know, what you describe, which is trends, right? So what trends are you seeing that you're trying to, or that are part of your thesis? Like what's your innovation model that's in the book? Yeah, that's exactly right, Michael. I think the, you know, there, to take a step back, the book has three parts. So part one is about the three waves of the great reboot, how we will develop over time, as well as a framework on how to think about the economics of pandemics and you know what that means for markets products things like that part two is about the four circles of impact of the great reboot which uh, we cover of you know how this major shift will affect the circle of home life work life city life and the world at large so four circles and the impacts happening on them and part three is is uh, what what I call the new operating system toolkit, which are, you know, precise frameworks, actions you can take to to navigate what's to come. And and especially on 
how to think about the, the impacts of the technology we all create in society at large. So at a high level, those are the, you know, the frameworks we're looking at. If I have to tease out one change uh, that, that unfolds in, in several different ways is that, you know, we're moving dramatically faster from an analog economy to a digital economy. And that was already happening before, but, you know, changes that maybe we thought would take 10 years to happen, happened in 10 weeks, you know, rise of e-commerce, public schools that not in, not in another 10 years wouldn't be thinking about uh, remote learning, have to think about it now, um, and several other things. And this, you know, this shift, of course, is, is a long-term trend, but it, but it really got accelerated, and, and that's the core of it. There's many ways we see this already, right? The, if you plot your favorite tech stock index compared to uh, traditional industry, uh, stock performance, you're already going to see, right? The tech companies are already way overperforming the, the traditional economy companies. And, uh, you know, just this week, there was this, the, I was on LinkedIn, and then they have uh, news headlines, right? That they, they pop up. And the two headlines I had uh, were, one of them was, worst contraction on record for the economy. And the second one was, big tech has a record-breaking quarter. Both of those were the top two news. Uh, yeah. which, which makes on, sense, though, because it's like everything's moving into the guys that were aligned correct with the trend. And to your point, the trend just got like shrunk and accelerated, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, that's cool. crazy. And, and yet, there's these guys are pulled before Congress a week ago. So I don't know what that was all about. Yeah, Talking you know, about it's breaking uh, up the, the four big job creators the last 10 years. Yeah, it's you know is is complicated topic. Obviously, they're very very well positioned to for this new world. You know, there's, they're one of the few organizational types that help us continue our lives. You know, less disturbed than they could have been, and that's amazing. They create a lot of jobs, a lot of wealth, a lot of innovation, and then at the same time, you know, there's these questions about. What's their their longer term impact on on upstarts and and startups and and I think it's is a big open question. You know? That that is true. I, I guess there is a concern that they're getting too big and in too many categories, which goes back to that conglomerate model. I mean, I think all four of those, and I I kind of talk about that in in what I've been writing, which is they are definitely a modern day example of combining technology with a conglomerate model, right? Yeah, I think that's fair. It's yeah. it's really really growing across categories it's impressive i'm still not sure how i feel about them being pulled forth talked about like antitrust laws but <laughs> yeah complicated super complicated. complicated yeah for sure yeah. um so the you, the third part of your book you talk about the new operating system framework what what are kind of some of the points in that like how do people use that to navigate what's coming or what's happening already yeah so one of them uh that, that really helps with that is uh, what I think of as the economics of the great reboot. And if you look at the impact of the pandemic from a more traditional economic framework, it's, it's kind of simple to understand actually. We have a, a kind of input, which is moving people and goods in the analog world got a lot more expensive than it used to be. So, Used to be cheap for a meeting person, but then all of a sudden it got expensive, risky, whatever that might be. And you know, if you if you look at traditional economic analysis, uh, when the price of an input goes up, what happens is that the demand for the substitute for that good really goes up. So, like for example, if chicken got more expensive, we might start eating a lot more fish, right? So we we substitute away from the thing that got more expensive. And then the other thing that goes together is the complements of those things that uh, are rising in demand, also rising demand, right? So like if we're eating a lot more fish now, maybe we're gonna eat more chips too. And that's really one of the key uh, frameworks we can use to see how, how, how the opportunities and how the new markets will open up. And uh, a perfect example is like, yeah, you know, Amazon is, is is having a you know record-breaking performance because 
buying stuff in person got really difficult. So the substitute e-commerce got have a lot more demand. But the complements of that are doing well too, right? Like FedEx and UPS, uh, they they benefit from it also. So looking at these complements and substitutes and how they open up and unfold over time for your market is a very useful way of uh, of you know identifying opportunities. I was just talking with a founder uh, this week who who has a major exit on on tech real estate in Brazil uh, and. And now he's doing home decoration and home decoration uh, marketplace. And, you know, wow. yeah, that's like a compliment, right? Like people are spending yeah. a lot more time at their homes. It's not obvious, but if you're spending a lot more time at home, then then you want to make it pretty and make it better than you That makes be. total sense. Because I, I think a lot of people, what I've observed, even like, you know, I'm in Southern California, you're in the Bay Area. Um, real estate, I think, has really popped because people are trying to upgrade their houses because they know they're working from home and now they got to have a home office or they got to have a back house or something, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's very similar. And it, it makes sense what you're saying, which is like, if you look at, you know, let's use the most extreme past example of the gold rush. During a gold rush, you know, people selling picks and shovels and engineering services and wagons, they all rose with that market, right? Yeah, picks and shovels, that's it. Makes total sense. Um, oh, I love it. So, and what, what's the timing of your book and how would people find that? So the book Maybe launches in, <laughs> no, we do actually. Okay. We have a, we have, yeah. We have a publication have checked that before. So it's, yeah. So no, you're good. So it's December, 2020, the book will be published and we've just went live with a pre-publication campaign, uh, in August 5th. And we'll do that for the next 30 days. And you can participate, you know, the, the pre-publication campaign, the goal is really to get the people really interested on the topic, engaged and as beta readers to help me refine and help, you know, share their own stories. And you can learn more about that on greatreboot.com. And if you go now, there's an early bird discount through oh, cool. uh, August 19th. Um, so what, what do you think is you know, what do you think the long-term effect of this is? Like, do you think that what's going on with this disease? Because, <laughs> I mean, coronaviruses are not new, but obviously the reputation of this one has gotten a lot of attention. Do you think it's actually going to continue on? If there's a vaccine, does that change anything? Or do we become a world that's continuously vaccinated now against coronaviruses, whereas, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of curious what you're seeing long-term. Like, how yeah. do you really play out? And I, totally. I, I don't know, maybe it's a function of being a biologist, but I'm not a biologist, so I don't know. If yeah, I... so you, I'll, I'll answer this in two ways. One of them is the, let's call it the vaccine timeline, 18 to 24 months. Nobody really knows. I certainly don't. But, you know, those are some of the credible estimates out there until we have a vaccine. Not just have a vaccine, but have it deployed, right? Like we all saw how long test kits took to get deployed totally. everywhere. So, so let's think about that timeline and then let's think about the 10, 20 years afterwards. And, you know, one of the things that I want to make crystal clear is that this is not really a book about the pandemic. This is about the shifts that have been triggered okay. by the pandemic, right? Yep. Uh, there's this great uh, metaphor I learned from some folks at uh, a group called Institute for the Future. And they say that, you know, this is like, you know, just like we're exposed to viruses and bacteria all day, every day, we only get sick when we're vulnerable to it in some way, right? And this is like society was sick and fragile in some ways that the virus is exposing. And the virus didn't really cause a lot of these things. Uh, certainly, the, you know, when we talk about the, uh, analog to digital and, and, uh, in certain economic shifts, the virus didn't really cause it, but it sort of made obvious, right? And when we think about the original timeline, you know, this 18 to 24 months, there's really the, the impact will be in three waves of, of the Great Reboot. Each country is in slightly different levels. In the US, we're at the beginning of the, of the second wave now. And, uh, and I previewed some of this concept on my column for Inc. Magazine, where I serve okay. as chief data scientist. So I encourage folks to yeah, we'll include that to the Google show. and check it out. Perfect. Yeah. So the first wave is really about shocks and substitutes, where 
we're living in lockdown. The, the cost of doing anything in the analog world skyrocketed. Sometimes it's impossible, right? We're literally not allowed to do certain things. So what you have is the substitutes for, 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 for this analog movement quickly rushing in. And that happens first on the things that are easy to substitute, right? Going from an in-person meeting to a Zoom meeting is easy, great. Going from, rather than showing up for a store, uh, you order it on Amazon, that was easy. We all already had Amazon accounts, the payment infrastructure already existed, all of that. So first wave is really about this shock and about the, the, the quick to, to, to turn around substitutes. Second wave is when we, we start you know, settling in a, um, a uneasy adjustment. And that's what we're in the beginning of in the US now. You know, we had uh, what, at least for unemployment numbers, was the fastest recession on record for the United States. It was, you know, highest unemployment number since uh, the Great Depression, uh, just in about a month and a half of lockdowns. Uh, Mind blowing that how fast it happened. And unemployment is still incredibly high, but then it starts getting lower because people start adjusting in, in certain ways. And what happens at that point is we start, you know, substituting the things that were not so easy to substitute at the beginning. And here's an example. Uh, you know, if you are a robotics company or some sort of manufacturing, automation, censoring, whatever that might be, you got hammered in the first wave because the factories were closed. You could not really get your job done. But on the second wave, you get tremendous benefit because you are a great substitute to having a lot of people inside a factory floor at the same time. So you got hammered at first, but then now you, you begin to see some benefits because people want to adopt technologies that they get uh, uh, less human one-to-one -one interaction in the workplace, in factories, and all of that. And then finally, the third wave is the, the, the adjustment. Once we, have, once we have a vaccine, and once a vaccine is deployed, and we're more or less able to do the things we were allowed to before, uh, there's really two things that will happen. One of them is we will uh, try to make up for, uh, for the time lost. And, and you know, the, I think there might be something like a roaring 2020s you know, at the third wave. Uh, after the Spanish flu, that's when the roaring 20s came about, you know, a time of great parties and, and people getting together and really living up the things that they could and doing the, the time of the Spanish group and the roar, like, <laughs> <laughs> like roaring twenties. I could see a war because there's a yeah, lot. Of I could see there. a war too, but that was not what I, uh, I, I'm well, like, if there's a war, I want to, how I want to form a robotic army with you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I digress. So the, the yeah. adjustment is the, and making up for lost time. Yeah, we make up for lost time, you know. That makes sense. And and it's uh, it and you know I think that's actually one of the really important points that that got me wanting to write this book because I saw people both dramatically overestimating the impact of the great reboot, but then a little paradoxically also underestimating. So they overestimated when they say, uh, you know, there was an article last week that was headlined the death of cities and how remote work will kill cities all over. And it's like, ah, yeah, you know, yeah, people will do a lot more remote, remote work. Absolutely true. There'll be new forms of hybrid teams, new forms of distributed teams, but there's a lot of other reasons we live in cities that are not work, right? Like cities are not going to die because of that. So people overestimate it. And when you're in the middle of the crisis, it's, it's easy to do so. But then they also underestimate it. And you know, one of one of the things I see debated a lot is what's the shape of the recovery going to be like? Is it gonna be a V shape? Is it gonna be a W shape? Is it gonna be L, whatever? And it's and it's almost the wrong question to ask because no matter the shape of the recovery, the composition of the headline number, be it jobs, GDP, products, whatever, will be dramatically different, right? And that's really the important thing. So if you're thinking about the shape of the recovery, you're underestimating the impact because yeah. the big story is that composition. There's, so, prob there's probably an element of nostalgia there, which is let's get back to normal. But I think what you're seeing, which is what I'm probably seeing, is 
that you hit, you said it with compos the composition of what the future holds is not the composition of the last 10, 20, 30 years, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it will be, it will be totally different. And that's really, you know, one of the big takeaways. So if we go back to the third wave, you know, one of the parts is this, uh, people making up for lost time because humans want human interaction and have done so for thousands of years. That's not going to change in, in a couple of years time frame. But then also we are going to realize that a lot of the things that we used to do, we don't really care to bring them back, you know? Uh, and we're also going to have built new infrastructures that will make those things a lot easy, easier and better. And, you know, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll go back to the office in, at some fashion once the vaccine is in, but probably not in the same way that we used to, where everybody was required to at a certain time and, and present in a certain way. And we we'll have new, new infrastructures that will make this easier, right? You know, we, right now we have Zoom, but, you know, Facebook has do, is doing some future of work initiatives that's about re-envisioning the, the workspace. This will come, come in play and, and will be a substitute in many ways for analog work. And another example that really comes to mind for me on that is at, at Startup Genome, we hosted, um, every year we do this Startup Ecosystems event. And usually it's hosted by the Next Web in Amsterdam and we're co-hosts of the Ecosystem Summit. That's how we usually call it. Or the City Summit, it, it changes a bit year to year. And we, we did that this year. The Amsterdam event, of course, was canceled. So we did it online. And the, this was maybe a month ago. It was, in terms of attendance and the, and the speakers, it was probably the best one we've ever had. Wow, that's great. Because we did not have, I know, it was, it was yeah. amazing. Because it was, you know, all of a sudden travel wasn't really a limitation, right? And mm -hmm. we had the prime minister of Serbia, the CTO of Amazon, oh, cool. top executives from Google, deputy mayors of Seoul, deputy mayors of London. It was just an amazing event, you know, and uh, I spoke at it and, and the other executives at Startup Genome spoke and participated. And, you know, it's really the, the, an example of certain things that when we do it in the new way, we're going to realize that they, they are better. We're not going to want to let go, uh, even though the, the, the need, uh, acute need for social distancy will fade away. Yeah, and I, I applaud everybody finally catching up to us on Zoom and working remotely. So, I'm, yeah, great. I'm a little sad that, you know, it's no longer a rebellious thing, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I know you have a distributed team, right? How is the, how, how is it for you now that, that every client we probably is on busy. the same? Yeah, I, I think a lot of people, we saw a big rush of people like trying to fix problems, right? Trying to, you know, they probably put off a lot of things around CRM and marketing automation and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. products. And there was a big rush like March to probably May, June. Uh, it could probably calm down a little bit. Mm -hmm. but, I would agree, um, yeah. You know, I, th I think it's a better way to work. I think that I love travel for personal, but for business, I think it's a terrible thing. And I'm yeah. kind of almost happy about this change. And I think it'll present more opportunities, which you highlighted a, uh, one, which I've experienced. Uh, and I want to invite you actually. So for example, on August 16th, my, my wife and I have been doing these monthly Zoom house parties. Mm, nice. Yeah. And I think it's been a really good thing because we actually, first of all, connect with people that we normally wouldn't connect with. Plus we've been inviting uh, two or three of our friends for each one to be kind of featured where we have a conversation with them. So I've met some pretty amazing people in the last four or five months that I probably never would have met before. It's fantastic. Uh, I, th I think like, you know, we had the last one, we had Daryl Davis, who I don't know if you saw the episode of the podcast on here, but he's a, a r and musician that's played with Chuck Berry for 32 years. And he's convinced 200 people from white supremacist groups to leave the KKK. <laughs> Such an amazing story. It's and like, like it's, hanging out with it's him all the time. He's a great amazing. Guy. <laughs> it's amazing. It's yeah. crazy. Uh, David Meltzer was at the last one. And David is a super inspiring guy. And then actually my wife and I were on his, his live yesterday. So, and we met Eric Lee yesterday, who's the mm -hmm. co-founder of LinkedIn. Fantastic. So it's like, I don't think if you had gone prior to this, that those people would have been as accessible. They probably weren't making such an effort. 
to be on those digital platforms. So I think it's a real, it's a real bonus. It's really opened up some opportunities. That's exactly right. You know, like what you described last there is, is the same impression I've had, you know, like for so many of these folks, you would just wouldn't, you know, like uh, present at something online. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. But now that everybody has to do it, it, it opens up new opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. So in a lot of ways, it's an exciting time. It's a little frustrating for others because you see the power and the um, the pain of bureaucracy. And I think, you know, we got to really th rethink those things because government can't be in a 200-year-old model and we're going into the future. Yeah, that's true. Like, but that's we'll see. There's probably a lot of resistance to change there. <laughs> um, well, listen, I want to be conscious of your time. Uh, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you think that we should? You know, one of the things of the of the other side, really, of the great reboot, because you know, we talked a lot about the opportunities that it opens up, especially for tech companies, and especially for founders, right, who have the flexibility to respond to these opportunities. The other side of the coin is the responsibility. And now, you know, there's this great quote from Vince Cerf, who's one of the fathers of the internet, is chief internet evangelist at Google, which is a fascinating job title, by the way. I find, yeah. find, it, find, it, find it pretty cool. And he has this group called Innovation for Jobs, which is really about, you know, thinking, how do we create jobs for everybody? with meaning in, 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 this, in this new world. And he's, he started that a few years ago with my good friend, David Northforce, and I'm honored to be a part of the network. And he, he's really narrowed in this importance of the responsibility for, for tech companies. And then he says, you know, geeks don't usually envision the impact of the things they create. And, and he says, I, I didn't envision all the ways the internet could unfold. But now that um, we, the tech community, are such a big part of the world and so large, so much leverage, so impactful. There's a lot more responsibility on thinking about the unintended consequences, both positive and negative, of, of what we do. And, and I think that's the other side that, that to me is important. I, I think the, you know, there's a lot of stuff being thrust on corporations. And it's like, we're looking at, you know, there's, there's an element of um, governments are not that good at serving our needs or they're good at other things, right? But, you know, again, it's a slow old model and the people that we're looking to for the help in areas that we should be getting from that infrastructure are the people we work for. So it's kind of weird because I, I think, you know, there's lots of calls for that would affect everyday people around security. There's problems with public concepts of healthcare. There's public education problems where, again, it's an old model that refuses to reform. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, I have the belief that entrepreneurs are who change the world. Absolutely. So I, I think I'm 100% on board with that. I think the challenge is how do we help more people become entrepreneurs and, and affect their own change? Because I think these giant corporations will morph into governments because they're just going to be large and bureaucratic, whether they're digital bureaucracies. So I, I think to me, it's really important that our education of people be around entrepreneurship. And that might be to be a designer, that might be to be a musician, whatever, but there has to be an element of, okay, the responsibility of, of the individual is to create Absolutely. great. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I think, and one, maybe it's, it's what you were hinting at too, when you talked about people putting responsibility on corporations, I'm 100% against this, uh, this general discourse that's very anti-tech, very anti-tech companies that kind of see some of the things that look at like downsides, but don't really see that, you know, they've been kind of the infrastructure Ooh. creators that kept the yeah. world running. Right. Uh, so I see that absolutely. Yeah. I 100% agree with that. Yet, I think especially if we as a community want to keep the you know the role we've we've received that uh, in society of these like important organizations that are you know looked favorably as 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 relevant and and impactful and are welcomed in people's homes right? On their pockets, on their everyday life. 
that like as a community we have this responsibility you know and i think it's it would better be proactive if we want to avoid things like uh you know um senseless uh intervention well i it, i think that the more that we look to corporations to be our daddy the way that we look to governments to be our daddy the worse things are going to be at those corporations i don't know if they will continue to be the innovation machines and when you thrust that responsibility on them, I guess the thing that I worry about is that they will accept it. <laughs> Look, I hear that. And you know, what I'm talking about is actually, I think, <laughs> I, I think it's really two things. You know, a, a technical debt is super common, right? For, for, for companies. And technical debt, yeah. I think, it, and I think we have a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a shadow twin of technical debt, which is fairness debt. And, the and you know sometimes just like technical debt you choose to to go with it i think zoom might be a uh an example of this recently and, and by the way like this is a concept i i'm introducing on a essay for a book with o'reilly that's coming out this fall and i also bring in inside the the great reboot book and you know uh, zoom as an example they they grew really fast right. and it's amazing how 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 their infrastructure held up it held up really well and in perhaps I, I do not i'm not privy to their you know internal decisions but i could imagine how as they were scaling their infrastructure they decided to not prioritize as much as they might have done otherwise cybersecurity questions right and they started popping up some cybersecurity concerns with zoom and i see that as very much as you know fairness that like they they sacrificed something that 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 is important for some users to to grow faster and like prioritize other things, just like we do with technical debt all day, every day. Sometimes you do it on purpose, and you know you have to pay later, as they did, and and they did do it. They pay later, right? They hired the 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 for Alex Stemo, uh, guy at Stanford now and chief former chief security head at Facebook and and Yahoo also. Well, and Dan Guido, shout out to him. I don't know if you know Dan. Do you know Dan from Trail of Bits? I don't think so. Oh, he was hired to re he wrote rewrote the code on uh, Zoom. That's awesome. <laughs> Great. That's fantastic. Yeah, we love to talk with him. Dan, we need a friggin' button to make it so I can automatically let someone share. I don't have to push it every time. There would be an idea. <laughs> Good idea. Push it once in the so, set. <laughs> So you know, like, and and if you if you look at their stock performance, it's it's hard to disagree that that was a really good decision. And very true. And yet the debt is there, you know, and you're gonna have to pay somehow. If you don't pay it, then you're gonna have then you might you have reputational costs. You might have regulatory costs. Sometimes you have market problems immediately, like your users start dropping. Like I'm sure that Zoom you know it's still the best alternative is what we're using now sure. uh, i don't know all plat every platform right but it's the platform that i use yeah. but you know if they had persistent cybersecurity problems that were not addressed and a competitor came along that did Crushed they them. would have market problems right Very so true. i i hear you and i and i totally agree just, that I'm i don't want the corporation should be the daddy <laughs> thing exactly. uh, but, uh, but daddy. i do <laughs> <laughs> but i do think it's important that we take on this responsibility as we get bigger you know like because otherwise if you if you don't pay off your fairness that you know like it's gonna come back with interest later maybe yeah i, I think first of all the future of cities is something i'd love to talk to you about in the future about i happen to think that we should get rid of all city councils and mayors and stop electing people and we should give a contract to amazon to run the city because then it's mass customized. The, yeah, it's interesting proposition. Want. I have to think <laughs> about that. It's like, listen, we're collecting all this money. Everybody, stop, stop fighting over what you want. Just everybody get what you want. Well, one thing I'm super worried about now is like how the cascading effect, right, effects on cities uh, mm. of all this crisis and how we might end up with bankrupt local governments because you know first you have the jobs going away and by the way this is like something that uh gary uh who's the gary ball is from the his chair of future of work for singularity university he oh yeah he tuned me into that that you know you have jobs and then the jobs start going away and then the businesses start failing partially also because people are not buying 
and then that turns into lost tax revenue for cities. And then we might end up with a really serious problem with, you know, local city councils, to your totally. point, maybe like we had in Detroit, you know, in a previous generation. It's it's totally an issue. And, and I think the corruption of cities is being exposed. Like there's an LA councilor that for 15 years, they, you know, they just booked them for traffic for basically being the gatekeeper financially on every building that was built in downtown LA. You look at what's going on in, in other cities like Seattle, you look at cities like Portland, you look at cities like New York and there's, you know, can, can people rule people in such a complex situation? Yeah. You know, or should we just I, give the contract to Amazon? I don't know. It's an open question. It's a thesis. Yeah. So I'd love to talk to you about that in the future. Listen, I want to be totally conscious of your time. We could probably go for hours here. I'm going to wrap up with a couple of quick things. First of all, how do people get in touch with you? So the, the, there's a couple of ways to get in touch with me. Uh, number one, I hope you go on greatreboot.com and participate on this pre-publication campaign about the book. I'd love to you know, share these concepts as, as they are being developed and, and start, you know, making this stronger, really dynamic for, for the world. So that's the number one way. Number two is you can find me on, on Twitter and LinkedIn. And I use those quite a bit. The it's, if you Google my name, there's not many, our Nobel Morelix is out there. So you're going to find it quickly. Mm-hmm. No worries. I thought Devlano <laughs> was a unique name, but I think he got me. Beautiful. It is very unique. Yeah. <laughs> It's a made-up name, but <laughs> that's another story. Great. A um, couple of the final things. Um, how are you changing the world? You know, I'll, I'll give a, a very domestic answer. I became a dad recently oh, in the cool. past year. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm on paternity leave as we speak. And I, if I'm totally honest, I think that would be the number one way, you know? Like, the it's just such a transformational thing to be uh, raising a kid in you know and the things I do with him matter for decades to come you know not just next year not just in the next month the next financial quarter but they matter kind of forever <laughs> and uh, it sense. feels very it feels very deep you know and feels very uh, emotional to think about the the how that links back to our collective ancestors you know and the human experience yeah not enough people like kids anymore so i applaud you for being a great dad i know well <laughs> there's a you know, weird especially here in the bay area there's uh, not many kids yeah, around it's quite, it's quite interesting Jeez, so crazy um have you ever read the book 1984 yes i have yeah we got one You'd be shocked. So I, you know what? I'm, I'm starting to add that question because you'd be shocked how many people have not. And I think there's some really interesting lessons for today. Don't, I don't know what your opinion is. But. Well, it's super timely. I think the, the fact that tech, you know, like technologically, now we could operationalize that and are operationalizing that in some parts of the world. Right. Uh, I think is, uh, yeah, the, I think is, uh, you know, very, very important. You know, one of the things I talk about on the book is, yes, you know, there, and I present specific frameworks to think about how your technology will affect the market and society at large. But there is a quadrant, and I name it like the four quadrants of unintended consequences. And one of them is unknown unknowns, really hard to do. And the tools are a little fuzzier. But one of them is, you know, thinking, bringing in science fiction to how you think about your technology. And there's actually some precise groups that do that really well at uh, in San Diego, at Arizona State University. There's a group in Paris that does that really well. And one of the quotes I mentioned is like good sci-fi uh, can predict not only the cars, but also the traffic jams. So, you know, when you talk about 1984, that that's, that's uh, to me is like a, a, you know, a very important thing to think about on, on how this, this can affect our world today. Well, I'm excited you've read it and I'm going to keep asking the question because it concerns me how many people have not and considering what we're, that we're living in, it's kind of weird. Mm. Um, okay, the final thing is when we have interesting guests on the podcast, we like you to nominate other interesting guests 
We typically talk to experts or entrepreneurs. Sometimes it's about how to grow your business with systems and software, but increasingly we're talking about the future. So who would you, Arnobio, like to nominate as a future guest of Automate and Grow? How many slots do I have? How many do you want? <laughs> I'll mention three that quickly came to oh, mind. Oh, cool. Okay, great. So one of them is Eric Qualman. He is a marketing and social media expert. He wrote um, a New York Times bestselling book on social media uh, called Social Nomics. And he, have, he has a new book out just now called uh, The Focus Project. I haven't read it yet, but I ordered it. So I saw some of the things about it online and, and it's about, you know, how to navigate this tough times we're in now on, on a personal level, you know, how do you, how do you find focus in a, in a complicated world? So I think that's one of them. The other one is uh, two good friends. One is Dane Stengler, uh, who is an amazing thinker about the implications of policy and government and entrepreneurship and how those two intersect. I think you're going to have a really good conversation with him because he's think, you know, when you talk about city councils, when you talk about a, a federal policy and things like that, he's, he's pretty, um, he's thought a lot about that and Love worked it. on that a lot. And I think you guys are going to have a great back and forth. And, and from my, quick preview with you i think you're gonna disagree a lot too which i think will be a, a great <laughs> podcast conversation and then i would also nominate uh the ceo of startup genome jf guti he, he, he when we think about innovation policy and startup ecosystems he's one of the foremost experts and and i think you you guys would have a fantastic conversation that's amazing well first of all thank you for nominating three amazing guests we got eric coleman dane stengler and jf from startup genome You've all been nominated as a future guest of Automate and Grow. Arnobio, I want to acknowledge you for the work that you're doing, and I want to make sure to invite you to our August 16th Zoom house party. I'm game. Thank you. Oh, as well, I'm thinking, I don't know if you're interested, but let's maybe we can do a Facebook Live to the Founders Pack group. Yeah, let's do it. I'll, let, let's talk about that. I'd love to learn more. Terrific. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go. I appreciate your time. This has been another episode of the Automate and Grow podcast. We will see you on a future episode of Automate and Grow.